And we're back. You are listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C Show. You're watching us on the Fight Now television channel. And if you don't have Fight Now on your sports channel lineup, you need to call your local television provider and tell them that you want Fight Now right now. It's that simple, man. Pick up the phone and call them. For all the information about the channel, uh, you can find it on their website, www.fightnow.com. And speaking of now, uh, joining us, we have a, uh, an author that just put out a book. Uh, it's called uh, The Gentleman Boxer. It's a story uh, about a, uh, a fighter that uh, fought in the 20s, uh, Joe Grimm. And the author uh, joins us right now. Please welcome Ian Grumeza. Good morning, Ian. Good morning. Good morning, Bill. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to, to fully read the book. Uh, I, I apologize for that. I, I know I, I mentioned that to you before uh, uh, we, uh, we set up the interview. But I have uh, uh, been in looking through it, and, and I'm amazed because right off the bat, the first thing that, that I, you know, I, I'm having trouble with is finding information on Joe Grimm. I mean, what's the story with that? How, how, uh, what, what's the deal? Why can't we punch him up uh, on a box rack and, and get the uh, get the right stuff? Uh, there's an original Joe Grimm who fought before the World War One, and he was famous for being knocked down so many times in each bout that people came to see if he would get up again. <laughs> so that is the original Joe Grimm. However. There were another maybe eight or nine Joe Greens who took the name from, from this guy. Uh, they thought I know that, that name. And one of them is my or our Joe Green, uh, who, who lived in uh, Massachusetts in uh, on Fall River. So he took the name because he wanted to do right what in the original Joe Green did wrong, meaning he will win. The other guy never won in his life one single bout. Oh, wow. Maybe two hundred times. Well, let me let me ask you this. Uh, let me. I, I should have actually started it off with this. How did you come across Joe Grimm, and what made you decide to do this book? Uh, maybe three years ago, I was uh, I, I I was having dinner in uh, in Pittsfield with a family who was related to Joe Grimm, and um, during the conversation, they came up with Joe Grimm. Who, uh, died just a few years before at age 96 and he was a professional boxer and uh, he scored 24 knockouts in a row and and he was never knocked, knocked out obviously so I, I was very very amazed I, I, I said who is this guy I, I have to know more about it about him so the family provided me with a with a uh, with a scrapbook which was filled with hundreds of hundreds of clippings from newspapers, from New England, from um, New Jersey, from New York. Uh, and I said, this guy is good, but uh, I could not find him on, a, on the Internet. I could not find him on a, a boxing encyclopedia. So I started to do my own research, and I was amazed what I discovered there. Because uh, like, uh, like Joe Grimm that I'm writing about, there were maybe in each uh, city or even in each town there was one local famous boxer like he was. And uh, we now, 60, 70 years later, we lost track of that really. We, we, we didn't uh, preserve, you know, the, the, the fact that there were hundreds and hundreds of Joe Greens who really made up the sport the boxing sport, make, make uh, boxing a king of sports, because they, the little ones, scrappers, like, he was a bantam, by the way, they entertained the public. They were the ones who opened for the big fights. They, sometimes the big fights uh, lasted a few minutes or a few rounds. But these little guys, they fought and they fought and they fought, and they were so numerous that uh, they, they fought two, three times a week. Versus the big uh, heavy guys who fought maybe a few times a year, so I I thought that this is an opportunity to pay an homage to the uh, lost fighters uh, in history of boxing, who really uh, brought millions and millions of spectators to the stadium. 
Well, you, um, you, you, you make a great point because the era in which uh, uh, Joe Grimm fought, you know, we really didn't take care of, of keeping good records, you know, and I think that that's the problem, and that had to be one of the difficulties that you ran into. And, and one, of, one of my questions was, uh, you know, I saw that, that, that you did go through a lot of uh, uh, scrapbooks and stuff like that. I mean, what was that experience like where you were actually basically going through this guy's own account and his own history, his own chronological order of, of, of the account of his career? You know, what was it like to work with his family and, and to be going through his actual stuff, his handwritten notes? I mean, you, you know, those notes that, that you have in the book seem to be the only records of, of, uh, of what took place in this guy's uh, life. The family was very, very generous uh, with the information, and of course, I used uh, everything I could from 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 their uh, remembrance. But I went to uh, Fall River, where he lived and fought. I went to New Bedford, where he won his major fights in New England. Uh, I went to Bayonne, New Jersey, to Jersey City, to uh, Hoboken. Uh, because he moved, uh, see, let, let me make a parenthesis here. Uh, at that time in 1920s, if you do not fight in Madison Square Garden, you do not count, my friend. As simple as that. The problem with Jim, <laughs> with Joe Grimm is that he, he could not fight in the Madison Square Garden. At that time in 1924-25, the garden was demolished and moved where, uh, from downtown moved where what the Benson Square Garden is right now. So he, he had a kind of awkward era to, to, to make a name for himself. Also, uh, if you do not fight in uh, New York City or in New Jersey at that time, you do not count. Even great uh, Jack Dempsey, uh, who won huge uh, you know, fights in, uh, in, in, in West and uh, 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 you know, in Chicago and so on, he didn't count. He had to come to New York City to reestablish himself. And remember when he came in, in uh, 1916, he basically, he and his uh, 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 manager slept on, on the benches and, 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 uh, in uh, Central Park because he really was a bum considered by the others. And the biggest uh, uh, purse he made was $150 that he split with his agent. And he had to go back home because he could not make a name of, him, of himself. Now, back to, to Joe Green. He was uh, uh, discovered, so to speak, or uh, spotted by a big promoter called Charles Dosiric from, uh, from beyond New Jersey, and also he was a promoter in, in, in New York City. Uh, and he asked Joe Green to move to New Jersey and start to uh, make a name of himself. And why in New, New Jersey? Because New Jersey at that time was a no-decision state. In other words, if you do not uh, 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 fall and, and never get up, uh, if you finish the fight standing up, doesn't matter how, how badly you are beaten, uh, the, 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 the thing was the, the fight was scored as a draw. Therefore, uh, was very little uh, uh, chances to do damage to your fighting record. Uh, that's why a lot, a lot of boxers start in New Jersey, because there was no, uh, there was no, there was only newspaper decision. Right. And that was because the fight, the the betting. I don't know. Uh, if you're aware, but betting was a huge thing at that time. Oh yeah, and the and the news the newspaper decisions. The the problem with that is you got the the guy from the hometown of one of the fighters covering it for their local newspaper. They see a totally different fight, and it goes down in their record as a, a newspaper decision win. And yeah. the guy from you know the other opponent, you know the other uh, guy in the fight, uh, his newspaper thinks he won. And, you know, on the records today, when you see a newspaper decision win, all they went and did is took the average of all the newspaper wins. And, you know, if, if Moore said they won, they gave the guy the win. You know, I mean, today, I'm not talking about back in, in those days. You're right. They, they were rendered no decisions unless you knocked the guy out. 
but uh, it was a, it was a difficult era for for sure. But we had a lot of talented fighters during that time. How did how did Joe Grimm fit uh, with some of the other fighters of, of the twenties? He did very well, as a matter of fact. He he knocked out, uh, for instance, two Filipino guys. Uh, they were bantams as well. Uh, at that time, the the uncontested champion. Uh, Till one year before was Pancho Villa Bantam uh, weight, and Pancho Villa died. He died on in the hospital, as a matter of fact. With like a tooth, he had the tooth, right? Punches. He had the uh, and, uh, he had dentist, uh, right? He so, had like uh, and a lot of Filipinos came to New Jersey trying to make up, you know, for for the loss of of, of Pancho Villa, but <laughs> Joe, our Joe, put them down you know, in the first round, in the third round. He starts spectacular, absolutely spectacular. Except there's a huge problem. The city already has three fighters as bantams, and one of them, Irish uh, Johnny Curtin, was with the, the, with the city um, uh, establishment for eight years, and uh, he was uh, one of the, those guys. is called the idol of New Jersey, who really, you know, he could fill an arena with his name in New Jersey. He was so well known. So here's the problem. Uh, Joe Green moves to New Jersey, to Bayonne, with his brother. I don't know how, how it happens, but there's always an older brother who interferes in the career of the, of the <laughs> uh, younger brother. So his older brother, Mike, uh, started to put pressure on Doceric, on the promoter and manager, to have a match uh, with... Uh, with uh, John, Johnny Curtin to establish exactly who is who and so on. However, uh, the city refuses to that, and he gives uh, gives uh, uh, Joe Grimm a chance to fight only as a substitute and only in emergency uh, uh, situations. So uh, Joe Grimm was there to establish himself and. The city believed that Joe would be there for a few years to do that. But no, Mike wanted Joe to be a champion in a few months. So uh, the more Mike put pressure on Joe, on, uh, I'm sorry, on the city, the, the less Joe was uh, likely to, to, to fight and, and establish himself because the city lost faith in his uh, uh, fighter. Now, what, describe his style to to us, uh, my my viewers and my listeners. Uh, uh, you know, what what kind of a style did did uh, Joe Grimm fight? He was named in many uh, newspaper articles as the uh, Dempsey of the band, Bandmen. Oh, why? Because uh, he he was uh, fighting uh, somehow. Bobbing, uh, uh, waving, and you know, fighting statically. In fact, he was one of those boxers that waited for the other one to make a mistake and, <laughs> and take advantage of that. But that was not because he imitated uh, uh, great uh, Jack Dempsey. It was because he was flat-footed. He could not chase the, <laughs> the opponent. Ah. So, so he decided to fight in his own way. You know. Half bend, you know, knees bend, and stay in a strong uh, position. And also, he had a, a huge hands. If you look in, in the book at the pictures, his hands are so large. Each boxer, each promoter, each referee looked at his hands and said, "Boy, you have a million uh, dollar punch here, you know, uh, in these hands." So he, his his style was. Um, was based on the fact that he was flat-footed and, and he was uh, always in good balance and uh, ready to punch really heavy. And, uh, and, and the second was that he was a gentleman in the ring. And the newspapers keep saying, uh, gentleman Joe, gentleman boxer, and so on. Uh, of course, it's hard to be a gentleman in the ring because it's a ferocious confrontation between two men who basically want to kill each other. But Joe, came from a very good family, he was an altar boy, he never threw a punch in anger, he, he, was, uh, he didn't come from a, a correctional uh, 
an institution, from broken family, from jails like the others. He was just a, a normal kid who happened to like boxing. He was a gamey. Uh, he went into the ring with such good disposition that the, the, the audience loved him. He was just a good, good fighter who enjoyed to win by outsmarting the other guy, not by overkilling him. You know, uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question. In, in the on the cover of your book, in the pose that that Grimm is is doing, it it almost looks like one of his you know favorite punches was either an uppercut or, or a hook, a, a left uppercut or a left hook. The way he he's standing there, uh, did he throw? Was he known for for uppercuts or hooks, or was that, was that just a pose that that he decided to uh, to stand for for that photo? His his favorite combination was a left hook and a right cross, and that was devastating. He knew that he was waiting the entire uh, fight for that opening so he can throw those two punches, and those punches never missed uh, a KO. Uh, Ian, do you follow boxing today? Do you still follow the sport? Uh, not that much, I, because I, I, um, I'm a writer. I, I write a lot of history and so on, but I'm very aware of you know, of, well, I, if I if I know there is a, a boxing match on TV, of course I'll watch it. Or if I switch the channels and I see a, a boxing, I'll, I'll. he he probably you, you can compare him a little bit like uh, between uh, Ray uh, Sugar Ray Robinson and Roberto Duran, I might say. Wow. He had, he had that kind of uh, instinct to to really you know finish the guy, but not by abusing, you know, the, 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 the power and the, for instance, if the guy was a little dizzy or something like that, or uh, if he was tangled in the ropes, Joe will never, never go there and, and trying to, you know, to, to hit a guy who was totally open and defenseless and so on. Uh, if the guy was down, uh, Joe was not hovering about him to, to, you know, to put him down again and again. He always gave the guy a chance to fight. As a matter of fact, when I was in New Jersey, I, <laughs> I learned about, I, I went to the sports bars, and I asked, you know, about the old days, and almost everybody had an uncle or a grandfather uh, or someone in the, in the family who was a professional boxer in their 20s. And uh, they were, they knew everything. They, they were absolutely, you know, walking encyclopedia. And one said, you know what? I think one of the guys is still alive. And guess what? I called the nursing home. And the nurse said, no, 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 Mr. So-and-so cannot talk to you. He's too frail. to said, ma'am, you know, let him talk just to say hello. And I, uh, he gave me the, the guy. And, oh, and, and she said, he has... Uh, uh, Parkinson, he has, uh, he has uh, what do you call that, uh, when you forget things? Alzheimer's. Uh, Alzheimer's, right. But when he heard of Joe Green, he said, I know Joe Green. <laughs> I know the dynamite punch and the soft-spoken gentleman. <laughs> there you go. It's, that it... was my title, my friend. I had no, no hesitation. Of course, he did, could not remember too much. He was too old and so on. T tell me, we're, ru we're, we're running out of time already, Ian, but tell me, I, I, he lived a long and, and, and good life. Uh, he, he was successful outside of the ring as well. Tell us a little about that. He probably made $3,000 in uh, ring money. And he bought with his brother Mike. Mike was good to him because when the Depression came, they, lose no, they lost no money. So they invested the money buying a grocery uh, store. And he worked there as a butcher. In fact, he built an apartment upstairs, and for the rest of his life, he lived there with his family. Uh, and also, he became one of the biggest uh, real estate investors in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, with his brother, because they, uh, unlike the other boxers, um, including Dempsey and you name it, uh, the Depression, uh, he, he quit in 1928. The Depression started in 1929. So he had his money put in a very good uh, uh, investment. And he lived a long, long life. He had uh, one son and three daughters, and he was one of the nicest men around, 
and uh, he was never sick. Wow. How Nine can how, how can they get your book? How can my viewers and listeners get your book? Oh, oh, that is simple. It's Amazon or Barnes and Nobles dot com. Okay. Or, you, or you, probably any bookstore you, you can order. Well, yeah. what I'm going to do is uh, I'm very interested in in, in uh, learning more about Joe Grimm. So obviously I got to finish this book. But I'm also if you could take some time and and send me a. Uh, uh, a JPEG uh, uh, of the cover, and I'll, I'll I'll email you the the requirements, what size I need. I'll put it up in our book club and uh, link them right to you, and uh, they can. Uh, uh, is is it possible for for one of our viewers or listeners to to get a signed book from you? Absolutely, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I received from San Francisco an envelope to sign labels. <laughs> So I'll, I'll sign any book. I, I, there's no problem. I'll be happy to. You know, I really want to learn more about uh, Joe Grimm because uh, it, it seems, you know, one of one of my pet peeves about the sport of boxing, Ian, is that, you know, we, we've forgotten, and I say we, meaning, you know, uh, the public has forgotten so much about these great fighters. And you're 100% correct. The boxing game in the 20s was, was so much different. It, it was really only baseball and boxing and horse racing. That's it. I mean, that's why everybody was, was involved in it. And, you know, what bothers me today is that the young boxing fans, uh, they don't understand that. And, and I'm not so sure how much video footage is, is available of, of Joe Grimm. I'm thinking hardly any. And, I and don't, yeah. yeah, and, and the pro... The, the boxing in the 1920s was an industry of $4 billion dollars. And to give you the idea how how how, how money making was uh, industry was that in 1927 between the match between Davis and Tony, 20 billion dollars uh, changed hands and betting. So boxing at that time was a, a huge, not only an entertainment, uh, the, probably the only entertainment in many uh, 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 towns, but it was a way to make uh, you know. Right. No. Money. I I, I know they used to bet. Uh, I, I'm finishing up. Uh, uh, my book is actually in a publisher right now. I did one on a, a, a bare knuckle guy, and they used to bet as the fight was going on. They would they would be gambling. You know, in the 1800s, it was it was amazing. Um, you know, Harry Grimm bet on, on himself all the time. Is how he made his most money. <laughs> yeah, made it made it outside the ring, of course. You know, and yeah. what I was getting at was that. There's virtually, with, with a lot of young fans today, if they don't see video, they, they, they discredit the fighter, and I don't think that's fair. And, and when I started doing some research on Joe Grimm, I found that it was very difficult to get information about him. Aside from your book, uh, there's virtually no other information. Uh, there's a million Joe Grimm's on, on BoxRec, and, and none of them seem to be the right guy. You know, I didn't see anybody with the, with the amount of fights that, that uh, you know, Joe Grimm, uh, according to your book, was in. Um, so I, I'm very interested in, in learning as much as I can about the guy because, like you, I, I've become uh, very interested. So you, you're going to be hearing from me uh, more and would like to get you back on. I, I, again, I apologize for uh, uh, not knowing enough about Joe Grimm uh, because uh, I, I haven't had a chance to, to finish your book. But uh, I certainly want to know more, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to, to get you back on sometime in the future. Really, any time. I'll be happy and honored to do so. Well, that would be great. And uh, do me a favor, email me, um, or I'll drop you an email uh, a little later on, and uh, uh, I will uh, tell you what I need, and I'll throw your book up on our book club, and uh, that'll help you at least get uh, uh, some of the diehard fans uh, some information on, on uh, the gentleman boxer because uh, uh, it's something I, I want to help you get the word out because it's important. Uh, the historical part of boxing is is something that we need to preserve, and uh, we need to preserve the memory of fighters exactly like uh, Joe Grimm, so I'm with you, bro. Uh, uh, Bill, I described 50 fights in the book of Joe Grimm because so much coverage was in the newspapers. And also, I mentioned hundreds of names uh, of, of that time when he was boxing, when he was active. So it's a lot of history attached to this, a lot of names that you cannot find in any other place. I found in local public libraries, but uh, otherwise... You, you know, you, you you don't see those names any place. It's like it's kind of uh, never happened. It's yeah, and that, and that's a shame. Touch. And that's a shame, and, and that's my that's my pet peeve, Ian. You know, it, you're right, and and the way you just de described it, it's like it never happened. I mean, why should these guys be erased from history, especially 
from boxing, and and uh, I, I I I can't stand it, and and uh, and it and, and that's one of my biggest fears. Fifty years down the road, you know, are they going to be talking about fighters that we see today as as great fighters? And it's a joke. Uh, you know, uh, the reason why I asked you if you were still in boxing is, you know, I wanted to to get your thoughts on on how a guy like Joe Grimm would be today. You know, who would you know would anybody beat this guy? And and you know, I know it's a tough question to answer, but. You know, they, they certainly weren't as tough as they were back in the 20s. Uh, at that time, the competition was, was fierce, was absolutely fearsome because there are so many of them. And that's why the, uh, the, 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 the American champions took over the world. You look at the statistics, the only American champions, because uh, uh, guys like Carpentier was a joke uh, compared to uh, Jack Dempsey. Uh, it's it's just one of those things that uh, 1920s was the best era in America in American history and and boxing became an Americana and we are now here in front of so many great boxers because these little guys and all others like them thousands by them as a matter of fact there were over 400 uh, uh, gymnasiums and uh, box, boxing gymnasium in the United States at that time and over five, uh, 4,000 uh, licensed boxers 1920s. It's, it's a huge amount of boxing activity there. You know, that's amazing and, and if you think about it today I, I would bet, and, and I don't know the answer, but I would bet my last dollar that there's not even in, in New York State alone uh, I bet you it is not even close to two. I, I don't even think there's 200. I, I, I would I would bet you there's maybe 150 licensed professional boxers in the state of New York. Uh, and just off the top of my head, so amazing statistics there. But uh, Ian, I appreciate you taking some time with us this morning, and uh, I'm going to drop you an email, and uh, uh, we're going to get you back on and 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 talk more about not only uh, uh, Joe Grimm but some of the other fighters that uh, you learned about uh, in the 20s, if that's okay with you. I mentioned all of them there because uh, uh, Joe Grimm fought in the same ring with the great ones. So, uh, what can I say? It's it's he is just a, a reason to write the book about 1920s, so to speak. Yeah. Well, listen, Ian. Thank you very much. It's uh, for everybody out there. The book is called The Gentleman Boxer. Uh, it's uh, written by uh, Ian Grumeza. And uh, you can uh, get the book on Amazon.com. And uh, I'll tell you another thing. We're going to put it up under the Billy C. Boxing uh, Book Club. So uh, look for it there. And if you order it through the uh, book club, uh, we'll get you uh, uh, directly to Ian so he can uh, sign a, a copy for you and all that happy stuff. Ian, thanks for taking some time with us. And uh, I look forward to it when we can get you back on, okay? It was good to talk to you, Bill. And um, thank you very much. All right, thank brother. I appreciate it. Take care. That's uh, Ian uh, Grumeza, and uh, what a, what a book! You know, I I, I got to admit, I uh, you know, I, he he sent me the book. All right, I'm going to totally be honest with you. He sent me the book, and I just got so tied up with all of our new shows and stuff, and I didn't get a chance to read it cover to cover. But um, I knew that we were going to be doing this interview, and you know, I started uh, you know going through the book, and and I found myself captivated with the book. You know, and. Uh, uh, what really got my goat is I, I couldn't find much inf information on Joe Grimm. And, and if you punch him up and try and find him under uh, box rec, all the Joe Grimms you see are not this Joe Grimm. I will tell you that because, uh, you know, some of the fighters and, and the, the records and all the losses and the knockout losses and all that stuff uh, is not the same guy. So, uh, you know, I hope you get a copy of the book. And uh, like I said, uh, you can get it at Amazon.com. It's uh, Ian Grumeza. I'll spell it for you. G-R-U-M-E-Z-A uh, is the author's name. Look for the book, The Gentleman Boxer, about Joe Grimm. I got to take a break. We'll be right back.